images, computational geometry. One of the issues which is the, uh, I think it's becoming interesting is the issue with depth images uh, and point cloud for various reasons, like the ability to create and generate such images very quickly and easy these days, and what application and utilization we can take advantage of this data is uh, interesting. So I'll start this course, which is, I'm not really calling it a course, I'm calling it a read gr reading a group. So I'll start with a practically a talking about what's digital imaging in general, basic concept, and geometric transformation, image interpolation, which is really the simple things that we will use. Then I will talk about the depth images, again, how we acquire these images, some of their properties, transformation we apply to these images. And then I'll go to projective geometry in 2D and 3D. Uh, about the estimation of projective transformation, about camera, a uh, model, and the uh, metric, and then, or the camera metrics. Uh, we'll talk about equipolar geometry and what's its elements, the fundamental metrics, how we compute these things. And then we will go to practically point cloud, or what we call the set of a, uh, the, uh, like depth images, and uh, we'll talk about 3D reconstruction. Then we'll talk about implementation, both in Windows and Android. And what I'm planning after that to go into a reading papers together. So we'll have a set of paper, like hopefully we'll be able to do that every week that one will volunteer to read the paper and then we discuss this in the general issue around the topic of uh, depth images will try to concentrate in two issues. One is the ability to generate images from a uh, stereo, which is now becoming available even in, in uh, telephones. So this practice, this telephone come with two cameras that can easily generate stereo images and we can, a, uh, not easy, but it's possible to generate actually 3D model or depth image. What we get from the Kinect and the originally the Prime Sense sensor, we can able to generate depth images with various like a, a quality. The main issue which is also we'll look into, it's not really as clean as it looks like because all these images encounter a lot of noise and we we'll try also to see how we overcome and reduce the amount of noise. What's really, where is the noise usually exist and how we can actually a, reduce its influence as much as we can. So this is, this is my plan for the course and I will start with, usually when we talk about digital imaging, it's become very important. It's, the, uh, because it's become very simple nowadays to get digital images in, in everywhere from our computers, laptops, mobile phones, camera, digital camera, and directly acquired into digital forms. We don't do any more about like typical images and scanning them and digitizing them. These are usually coming in a digital form. And practically we can perceive or look at these as metrics metrics of pixel, or we often call them a grid of pixels. And the issue with this grid of pixels, the value in each element, which is the basic element, we call it pixel, could be either like one scalar value, and that we'll call it a grayscale. Usually we're talking about between zero and two, one byte, which is zero to 100, like 255. Or any other variable, practically it doesn't really matter. For grayscale images, it's actually scalar images with one value. We could also talk about a color images, which is red, green, the blue. Or we could talk about images with multiple channels, like red, green, the blue, and alpha. Or many, actually, application take images and store various data. For example, if we look at computer like a uh, hardware or GPU, for example, the texture memory, which is originally intended to store images as textures, have been 
use this kind of memory to store various data structure embedded in matrices. So practically, it's in, in all our computation, we look at this as a matrix, which is with values inside. So the different issue, which is when we talk, we talk about resolution, which is one of the important factor when we talk about the, the, which is the number of pixels in a space unit. This is what we call resolution. This is, I mean, practically nowadays we're talking about megapixels. And in the same time, we can talk about the range of intensity values. It's often in, in our, like, a, uh, after acquiring the image, we don't pay much attention to this because the image we receive already quantized or, or sampled and quantized. If anyone, like, finds some term, which is, I assume, all of you know that, but it's really feel free to interrupt me and ask any question because the idea that we, like, try to bridge all the gaps and reach a point where we all kind of like know the, the kind of the terminology that we will use. So the sampling is what we cut from the device. And this device eventually will give us, for example, an image, grayscale image, for example, one byte. The range between minimum intensity and maximum intensity this device will give us will be quantized into to like uh, 255, for example, ranges in order to enable it to fit in one byte. So this is the procedure of quantization, which is the intensity range determined by the device. But after the quantization, practically, we get a value. And the value, it's interpreted based on the device, the display device. But from our perspective, practically, it is a value that ranges between 0 to 255 or any other value. It's like the, after this, the, the, uh, the, acqu the acquisition, it's practically we don't care about the intensity. But many, many actually application then after that, we'll see about the distribution of the intensity within this image. For example, we may get image which is very dark image and which is mean the intensity is low in most of the image or very bright image and some or, or there are many techniques in digital image processing try to compensate for this and correct the images usually through construct correction or various transformation that we will see now so the various transformation which is we could actually classify into a, uh, into, um, I would go into the spatial domain. So I'm not going to other domain. In the spatial domain, we're talking about intensity transformation and geometric transformation. And I will explain later. There are other domains which is transform the image from the spatial domain, which is the pixel domain, into other domain. For example, the frequency domain which is we take the image, transform it into using Fourier transform into the frequency domain. Here we are not talking about this. We, I don't think we will use it for the, at least for the, the first part of the course. So what we call the intensity domain, we change the intensity, which is the value of a pixel, based on various technique, which is I'll talk about later. The geometric transformation, we change the location of the pixel. It's because the images, the pixel in the images are overlaid on a grid, usually changing the location of the pixel and counter also additional change in the intensity value, which is also we'll see. So when we talk about the changing in the intensity value, usually the, what it's a, uh, why this shift to the uh, aligned somewhere to the opposite? Uh, sorry about that. This is, should be.
should be here no okay it's not this one the 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 writing direction we don't see it anywhere here no okay since you guys all of you are using to the writing from like a uh, left to right so uh, practically I don't see this icon <laughs> so the idea of the intensity we change the value of the pixel and there are different techniques to change the value some of these technique based on the value of the pixel you change it to different intensity which is this is what we call intensity transfer the other technique which is take the neighborhood of a pixel and change its intensity based not only on its value but in its value and it's a neighboring technique. So usually when we talk about like intensity transfer, we have a transfer function, which practically take at one side here, we'll have the original image, and simply we'll have in the other axis, the a, uh, target image or the destination image. So for example, if we want to change the intensity of that pixel, it's for example, intensity is R0, so it's changed to the intensity of R0, which is, will be S0. This is simple, actually, intensity transform, which is based only on the transfer function and not in the neighborhood of a pixel. So there is a lot of transformation like this. One of the simplest is the negated transfer, where I change like bright to dark and dark to bright and the opposite. We have log and we have power. All these transformation usually look at the value of the pixel and the function. This transfer function will make the transformation to the target value. But there is an another like domain which is sorry. So there are another domain of function, which is we often call them filters. They are look at the neighborhood of a pixel and change its value based on the neighborhood. We know like the smoothing filters, which is I assume many of you are aware, or if we look about the edge detection, practically if we look at a pixel, we take for example the neighborhood of a pixel the simplest one will be, for example, 3 by 3. And the new value of this pixel will be based on the some like computing the filter on these values. Usually the common things is, for example, the like the filter will be in a matrix and we will multiply action. Sorry about, let me just kind of figure how to turn this off. Let me see how I turn it off. Okay. It's supposed to be. Okay. Now I understand. So this is one of the option of applying a filter to the image. So this technique, practically, what they are trying to do, they're trying to change. <laughs> Why? This is not my laptop. Otherwise, I will postpone. OK. Sorry. So they, uh, what we, what practically this is doing, trying to do changes on the intensity of the image. For example, smoothing, which is to try to reduce noise, or kind of trying to emphasize some features as edge detection, for example. So I assume these things are not new to you. If anyone would like to hear more information about this, please let me know. So don't let, don't let us go further without really if you don't know these, these terms. 
Okay, so what we talk about geometric transformation is we doing practically simple transformation on the image. For example, the basic is the identity transformation, which is all these algebraic transformation. Identity, we, do any change. we don't do any changes in the image. We could scale the image by actually factor in C direction or a Y direction. And we could do actually rotation around the some kind of like position. Usually we assume in this case the origin by a, an angle alpha. We could also do translation or shear both horizontally and vertically. So the how practically this is done is very simple. Let us assume we'll have a scale of this image. We will take practically multiply the transformation by the position. For if this is the transformation, which is we will talk about, we'll multiply it by the vector, which is in this case will be homogeneous coordinates. And this is will be the vector after the transformation we will have. Now, one of the main problem is that the original image, these points, live in a grid. When after applying this transformation, there is no guarantee that the target position will be on a grid. So eventually, what we will do, we will find kind of truncate the position, either like using kind of approximation, kind of usually around the value, or taking the floor, or taking the feeling, whatever we think is the appropriate a, approximation. And we get the target position of the pixels. Now, the big problem is in, in this going this direction that we may end up actually having empty pixels, which is do not have any value. So how we will deal with this? is one option is to try really to kind of like more working with in kind of like looking at these images as a pixel as a rectangle or square in this case and see where this square will be mapped so it will cover these pixels. But again, this pixel it's clear that it will occupy the entire value. What value will take this pixel? Or what value will take this pixel? Does anyone have an idea? Could be, maybe, like 30%, 60%. It's, this is what we call a forward scanning. We take the source image and transform it into the target image. And that's a nightmare to implement. Because practically, you need to compute all these percentage and then accumulate them. And eventually, will not get really a good image. It will be working with all these percentage and all these transformation. It's a nightmare. The data will be requantized. Re in any way, it will be not only, but the, the target will not be accurate as we would like it to be. Does anyone have an idea how we overcome this? You keep an existing model of the original. Um, object and then compare that, constantly compare it, just have it as a reference. This is what we are trying to do this here. So it's, but that's taking all these percentage and kind of lay the, the kind of backward forward computation is, is complicated. Um, maybe just copy the value, the same value to the next. Uh, what if there is a scale, for example, I showed in the top where we have scale and rotate. So if we copy, we'll get like something which is more block. Like exactly if you scale just an image, you will get pixels bigger or the image will not be smooth. And you can interpolation. Then the interpolation will be even more complicated because you don't know which to, to, to like where to interpolate in the weight of the a, uh, pixels. So if you have a one like pixel which is empty, how to interpolate its adjacent pixels. You, you need to have an idea about the transformation to see its neighboring pixels. Could you calculate the inverse transform and apply a function backwards? 
this is exactly the solution. And this is actually the elegant solution. Instead of computing the, the transform array, what we are going to sell is the target image. So why not to work in the target image? So we know that this is will go pixel by pixel. We guarantee that we're filling all the pixels. And we guarantee that we are filling the right value for this pixel. Now, if I'm taking this pixel and then applying the inverse transform, I will get the value from this point. So I know that this is the value I will fill that pixel. That's actually the, the, the very simple and elegant solution. The problem become we are not, rarely will be lucky that it's if we are getting like kind of like our pixels coming to the center of the image, we need to run actually and they maybe uh, fill a lottery because we will have very, very low, like little chance that we will re really be in the center of the pixels. So we need, we get always somewhere in the pixel. Now, we can take several approaches in order to compute the value of this point. It's not the value of the pixel. We know the value of the pixel. It's the center of the pixel. What's the value of this point? If it's here, it's the value of the pixel. If it's here, it's maybe less. If it's here exactly, which one we will take? Or it's not necessarily if it's fall in this rectangle, it's mean it's take the color of this pixel. So here we have different technique. One is called the nearest pixel. Take the value of the nearest pixel. This is the simplest one, which is if we fall in this rectangle, we take the value of this pixel. If we fall here, we'll take the value of this pixel. But that, what's the problem of this? The images will look like blocks. We'll have clear boundary. Why we will have clear boundary? Because all these pixels, which is, for example, let us assume these pixels, three pixels come from this original pixel. And then we'll have three other pixels come from the neighboring pixel. So practically all these will have the same color. And all these will have the same color and we'll have sharp change. This is the problem with the nearest pixel. Now, if we can take kind of different approach and say, okay, we can make it better in order to overcome this block issue is by taking what we call the adjacent pixels. So if we have these kind of pixels, one approach is take the average. You fall here, you have four closest pixels. Take the average of them. This is what we call the average interpolation. But again, the average, which is, you give a weight to this pixel, which is very close, and a weight to this pixel, which is very far, which is, doesn't seem to be the accurate or the best accurate. So the other approach is to take what we call interpolation. Now, interpolation means we will take the value of, if we have two pixels here, we'll take the value of the pixel ci's proportional to the distance from the nearest pixels. So which is mean that to the color of the value of ci, ca will contribute more than cb. And that's very simple linear interpolation. So ci will be 1 minus t, if we assume the distance between these two pixels is 1. And this is 1 minus t multiplied by ca plus t multiplied by c, which is in one domain. This is very simple. Now, how we do this in two domain image? So for the two domain image, we have four pixels. This is the value we want to compute. Does anyone have an idea? Would you do it diagonally as well? Uh, the like uh, vertically and horizontally as well as diagonally to account account for the 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 first two is, is is the first is enough actually. If we take the inter linear interpolation interpolation between this and this pixel and compute kind of imaginary point here, its value, and the same we do it here. So practically, this is what we call 
C top and C bottom. Practically, we take this, the value in this point and the interpolated value in this point, which is then we have the same problem, but the same actually technique to take the value of this point by taking the linear interpolation of these two values. That's actually what we call a, it's a weighted average. If we take these two values, we compute a weighted average of the four pixels, where the closest pixel will contribute more, and the furthest pixel will, compute the le will contribute the least, which is what we call every pixel will contribute a value which is proportional to its distance, or inverse proportional to its distance from the, this point. Is that clear? OK, now this is, this is one, if you are going to deal with a uh, kind of a normal images, this is good for many solution and uh, for many images and fast. But if you are kind of looking at the high end like images where you really want to get an accurate value, this is not good enough. If you are going to work, for example, with all these kind of like a, uh, magazines which is just show kind of like uh, modeling images or cars or like vehicles, whatever, and the quality is, is very important, this is not enough. And that will lead to what we called a cubic inter or like quadric interpolation or cubic interpolation, which is mean we try to, here is the point we want to approximate, and these are the neighboring pixels. This is not the center. I just place such that this point is the value where I want to compute. Now, if I assume, so practically what I want to approximate, if there is a function which is trying kind of to pass, I want to kind of like estimate this function. So I have these samples. This is not the function. This is not the function. So unfortunately, I don't have a figure, but this is, if I have these values and I have the samples, which is. So is this trying to avoid problems in the data after it's being quantized? Uh, not, yes, part of this is, but this is, let us assume this is the, the values in the image. Now, the location which is I'm trying to compute is here. So if I fit a function in this, in these samples, then it's become very simple that this is the value which is I'm looking for. Now what we saw in the beginning, the nearest is the practically this approximation. And the linear interpolation, which is I showed a little bit earlier, will try to get the, this approximation. A cubic interpolation or quadric interpolation, it tried to, bit, to fit actually in these data points a quadric function, parabola in this case, or cubic function in this case. Now, one of the things which is what we will find that we don't need actually to do this fitting or, or we can, instead of doing this fitting at each time, what we will try to estimate, the fitting will be translated into a weighting average of the, or the, the contribution of each neighboring pixel. For example, if I know that how much this pixel and this, these pixel will contribute, this is, will be enough to do the approximation. Now, the simple things when we are like the normal thing, when we want to talk about like how much I need, what's really the, the contribution of each one of these pixels, we usually think about Gaussian, which is what do we mean by, by this, which is mean for this point, this pixel will contribute by this amount. 
this pixel will contribute by this amount, and this pixel will contribute by this amount, and this pixel will contribute by this amount, of its value. That if this is 0 0.5, this pixel will contribute 50% to the, to the value of this pixel, which is maybe this is too much if this is 0 0.2. And the same thing, this is will be maybe higher, and this is, which is like, Going along what we have just said, closer pixels will contribute more than far pixels, and, and it's kind of like will be easy to compute this. So if we are going to look at this, which is mean these two will contribute more than this one or this one. Now, how many, if we are looking into cubic interpolation, which is mean how many free, like, degrees we have in a cubic function, four. If I'm like writing the cubic function as a t plus b t plus c t plus d, this is what I'm talking about this. Which is mean, in order to determine the function, I need four four equation or four terms and which is which is mean I will need four pixels the four closest adjacent pixel to this will be enough in order to compute this in 2d and in 1d in 2d it will be four by four which is will be in this case 16 pixels and now how we compute are we going to do really fitting of a Gaussian we don't need to. What we will be, we know very simple, like if we think about, for example, Gaussian could be approximated as a sinc function, and then we know from mathematics that sinc function could be expressed in a, to in, in a Taylor sequence. And then if we think about this value, we can actually, instead of talking about the, this function, we'll talk about an approximation using the first four terms of the polynomial or Taylor polynomial that represent this function, which is in this case, we will move from something which is hard to complicate to something polynomial very simple to, com to, to compute and calculate. So practically, the value we are looking for will be very simple. This is the value of the pixel in, 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 in an image will be sum over the neighboring from minus one, I'm just using minus for simplicity, to two, minus one to two. I take the value of these adjacent pixels multiplied by their contribution. The contribution in the x direction and the y direction. And this is how we will be do the approximation. This is Practically, when you look at this, is very simple. Is eventually what you will end up doing, you will end up having a metric, or like, like you could instead you can compute this on the fly every time, but it will be too much to do. So one way to do this is to approximate this. What do you mean to approximate? Like convert this computation into a lookup table, and that will be very simple to to do. So if we're thinking about these are the four by four. These are four by four, but here they are not four by four, yes? They are five by five. So it's actually it's not my mistake, and it's intentionally. Even so often I do mistakes in these kind of like uh, presentations. But we are dividing this pixel into four regions and taking Every time our value fall in one quarter of this pixel, we'll take the same, we will assume it's actually the, the, the sample point is in the center of the quarter. Just here we are kind of compromising. Instead of taking a, the, the point exactly, we can divide the pixel into four and taking the, any point which will fall in one quarter as the center of the quarter. If some want to do more approximation, he can divide this to further refine in order to get more accuracy. But practically, this is good for many, many applications. 
And now what we need to compute, we compute this instead of this function all the time. We compute a, a coefficient, because practically what this is, this is a coefficient. So we compute for each region, for each quarter, the contribution of each one of the 16 adjacent pixels. And then we, in this case, we'll have only four lookup table. Everyone is a matrix of 16 pixels. And what we will do, we'll only check in which quarter we the original value fall. And then based on that, we will see which lookup table will do this kind of very simple a multiplication. So this is can, this is practically most of the a, uh, interpolation we need. And this interpolation, we need to carry it like in many places. It's useful in not only in geometric transformation, it's use, uh, useful also in order to try to estimate values of adjacent like of pixels, and the, uh, which is our value not only in, in a pixel, we're in position where they are not really the sample point, but kind of a different point. Is that clear? Exactly. Yeah. So it's very, after computing these kind of matrices, you are done. It's become really very simple. And these matrices could be computed based on this polynomial, which is also not complicated. One thing which is, sorry, one thing you need to make sure that the sum of every 16 coefficient should be 1. Who can tell me why? Yes, the entire intensity will go up or go down. So this is, you need to make sure that the sum of these, all these coefficients will be 1. How yes. do you want to do that? Like if you take the top of pixel, for example, I guess two thirds of the pixels are available. Yeah, the one thing which is, is a good question, what if I don't have in, in the edges, how will do the how will I will do the computation in the? One. If this is the image, one of the simple technique in dealing with filters or anything which is involve neighborhood, let us assume the radius of this neighborhood is R. So the simple things is to create a boundary which is of. This is a mirror of the R pixel in this, and a mirror of the R pixel in this, and then a mirror of the R pixel in this, and a mirror of the R pixel in this. So, and then I work only on the original image without worrying about actually any boundary. Okay, what it's, it's, I mirror this. If this is the pixel. Yes, actually, copy this pixel will be copied here, and this pixel will be copied here, and this pixel will be copied here. Mirror. So this is the best technique people use in order to avoid all the kind of like a uh, kind of a uh, extreme cases. You don't need to check about zero. You don't need to check about like if you are out of the image. Very simple, and you are uh, you are done, and you work in the original domain. Practically, most of the uh, like image library enable you to extend these images, which is just to create kind of a larger canvas, and then you can copy the pixels. Are you able to set it to like a transparent sort of color? I guess you'd say that it's not really a color, but like to define the edge border to make it kind of like a, a smooth transition, or is it not possible? The I did not get the question. Well, so um, instead of, say, in copying the pixel entirely, yeah. would, could you have something which is just like a, um, a transparent pixel as opposed to a blank pixel? Yeah, but it's, again, you need a value here. Yeah. So if you, in any case, you need a value. So one, one kind of like things is just to ignore these values and actually compensate the sum accordingly, which is not easy to do at each time. The same thing is you mirror them. In practice, I guess there wouldn't be that much difference. But if you used uh, a proper quadratic kernel for the corners, would there be much 
It pretty much will be the same because what you will get, if you are going, for example, this corner, you will say, I'll have these four, four contribute for the quarter. Yeah. Because what you have actually do, you have taken these four pixels, flip them to this, and four pixels flipped to this. Practically, you will get very similar values. <coughs> some some approach it try to copy this one, but I find like like, like mirroring more accurate than than copying. No, that doesn't make like really measurable difference. There is a mathematically there is a difference, but it's practically really uh, not really uh, not yeah you, you can ignore definitely whatever you do. That you take from that pixel is kind of close to not not much anyway, so it's not going to have that big of a exactly yeah. Any other question? Okay. Okay. So this is practically continuing this this approach by how we can doing this computation in, in looking at a pixel and delta x and delta y. This is will be similar value, just more kind of simpler a uh, representation. Now, when we're talking about usually digital image system, which is nowadays, we, we're talking about a um, connection to a network, which is we always assume if it's local or whatever. And then we have a computer or whatever machine that do computing. Could be on the camera itself, could be on mobile, could be whatever for us. And then we have a display, and we have the mass storage. And what we will get, we get usually a processing, like image processing software, which is nowadays there is a lot of library that you can in almost for either for a mobile or for a, a PC, which is some of them running in all platforms. Like it doesn't matter if it's like multi-platform. Some of them run on specific platform. And we will have a hardware. One of the problems, which is the, this part is a little bit going actually down. It used to be the case that there is a dedicated hardware for image processing. Actually, there is a some chips would call the SP digital a image or DIP digital image processing chip. Nowadays, it's become less and less because of the increase in the computation power. Nevertheless, we now have a the main CPU, which is what we do the computer and kind of more the specialized processing or the like software computing. Nowadays, almost even mobiles come with a GPU, which is a, it's a, a graphics processing unit. And this is a practically a very powerful, a, uh, I would say, device for a lot of image processing a technique because it's practically parallel a uh, computation power and based on like very simple kind of streaming processing and make it easy to parallelize because you are not allowed to do any computation. So as long as you be able to subdivide your problem into small problems that you can run in parallel is this is really very a very powerful machine and when we are talking about images the subdivision is already there because we are talking about pixels as long as we're doing local computation you can really do it fast because it's simple it's just a core that will run over all the pixels in parallel or like the neighboring pixel in parallel so this is one of the things which is now a lot of actually a image processing libraries <coughs> include a, uh, a GPU implementation. So this is, a, this is something which is we want to a, a bear in mind. Now let us move to depth images. 
And again, what we want to talk about depth images, I don't know how much time we'll have. We'll have a, uh, we're supposed to go for like 45 minutes, but I will take a few minutes more, just kind of like, and next time we will we'll go for like two hours. I assume that will be good for a, or hopefully easy for us. So we'll talk about acquisition property properties and transformation. So when we talk about acquisition, originally, what we will get will be able to take a device, let us call it a camera, whatever it is. And this device will give us an image, which is this image practically is not only including the x, y values, which is what we usually used to call the intensity, or illumination, the intensity value. But in this, we'll be able to get a depth value. What a depth value means? which is a value which is normalized and computed with respect to the kind of bay or with respect to a known position within the device. So it could be the kind of like the virtually exist in the device or could be a point which is like a focal point which is behind, but it's somehow normalized to all these pixels. So this is, is this point is clear, which is, is not really a value which is like, even it's, first of all, it's normalized, but doesn't really mean that a distance from the device itself and the, the object. It should be for all the value of the, pic, all the pixels, it's all of them computed at the same, but with respect to a point somewhere. Could be in the device or behind at the device, which is mean virtual point. There is a three main technique which is I'm going kind of to talk about. One is the stereo illumination, one is the structured lighting, and the 3D laser scanners. So stereo illumination, the idea is there is practically illuminating the object from different sources and trying to estimate the value or the depth based on the difference in the illumination. One of these kind of technique was a, this is the, the capturing device will be some point here. If this is my domain, for example, and I will have this my device, I'll, I'll illuminate from this position, take an image, and then illuminate from this position and take an image. Usually two positions are not enough. You need at least four. And then based on the diffuse illumination in the image, we'll try to estimate the depth from the camera. These are not accurate devices, but these are the early technique which is which were used to estimate the depth or to create depth value. Usually the it's not it's a lot of computation to try to kind of like compute the depth from the shading in this. Usually it's called depth from shading or stereo illumination. Structured lighting if I have two cameras, and we'll talk about this a lot, but just for, for simple. If I have two cameras, which is we call stereo cameras, and the main issue, which is I will take two images from these. Each one will create an image. For example, let us assume this is the, the word. Now we have one camera here, and we have other camera here, and we take Now, we can talk about only the region which is like kind of common to these two cameras, where this is where we have this information here. Okay. If this is the place we have the information, now we can estimate the depth of this one. 
if I know this is the image which is the first image and this is the second image, let us assume we have a coordinate system here and we have a coordinate system here. The first step, can I have other colors? Okay, here is a black. So let us assume we now, if we think about this pixels, this is the image of this pixel, and this is the, which is mean. Now, we take that these two points are corresponding. These, this point to correspond to this point. If these are known, now and this is coordinate system is known, you can, again, like we have some problem with the, uh, all these. OK. So if this is the green one will be kind of, let us call it the global coordinate system, then the, the value of this pixel it falls in a point which is, this is the coordinate system. So if I try to get this line L1 and this line L2 in this coordinate system, the depth of this point will be kind of computed easily by the intersection of these two lines. Yes? And this is how I will compute the depth images as from stereo images. Now, the big issue is how we make compute these a uh, correspondence. This is, this is not simple. And the structured lighting is usually illuminating the world with light, usually invisible light, because you don't want this to interfere with your RGB camera. So this invisible light will create a structure, which is, could be a grid, could be a, any kind of like structure, which is you think or random structure, that help creating this correspondence. The aim of the structured light is to create or simplify kind of computing the correspond a correspondence between these two images. So the structured light, the constructed light, requires zero dimensions. Yes. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is the simplest technique. I will talk about like something which is you can compute without stereo cameras. But the, the early structured light is computed with the, with the two cameras. Now, there is other technique, which is a few, one of the things which is, if you have a structured light, let us assume what's going with Kinect, for example. What's going with Kinect, you, thank you. What's going with Kinect, practically they illuminate the image with a small, circles, all of them uniform in the same size. What you will get in this case, if the object is small, the sphere will be, if the object is close, the sphere will be the circle. Will be big. If this is far away, the sphere will be Let us assume this is the structured light, which is, we can think about it as these circles. If we think about this, every circle in the, in the two domain, what we will get, let us look at this circle, and this is the illumination, so this is the circles we will get. So if we are thinking about object which is here, this is will be the circle. If we are thinking about object here, this is will be the circle. Sense. Now, then they take a photo of these images, and then where they will get like for every pixel, which is, should be higher resolution than the structured light, and these structured light, I, 
separated. This is one of the problems that we don't get high resolution, depth resolution of the connect. And then they will read these images. This is which is make it very simple. And then for each pixel, they will determine the circle or the projected circle which is belong to and compute the size of the circle. And this is, will be used to compute the depth. So in this case, one camera is enough. So this is if you are like this technique. The third technique, which is the laser scanners. OK, let us see. This is the structured light, which is used. If you see, there are two cameras. And this is the structured light. This is coarse structured light. This is fine. And this is what you will be able to reconstruct using structured light. So usually, as I said, the objects are illuminated with invisible light, not to interfere with the, with the RGB. A laser scanner, usually what you, it's a, what you will get a laser beam. And then you all this kind of laser technique to compute the distance, which is based on the, on the actually the phase of the returning a, uh, ray. And the, uh, the problem is with black. For example, if we forget your name, yeah. Seth, if we scan Sam, most probably his hair will be in his shirt. So we'll see his hands. And this is the, because the dark colors absorb like the, uh, the light, which is this is the big a disadvantage of the, the laser. And usually, there is a lot of a, the, they can do this technique is a uh, very dense with high resolution and fast. And nowadays, actually, there are scanners, not only scanning kind of device, which part of the machine, but there are many devices around the world where people are scanning cities. There is a lot of project to trying to scan cities. So they usually have a scanner in top of the car. And this is scan will be able to scan around it. If, if you see the car was driving in this road, and these are the points we will get. My um, brother-in-law studies anthropology in Dhaka, and he has uh, a laser scanning kit, which takes it to caves. And this uh, 3D models of the caves. Yeah, so and this is. High resolution photography, mm. you can like match those photographs up with the laser scanner. Yeah. To produce like a complete model of like the internal structure of the cave. Yeah. And he also does the laser scanning all the way through the cave, like yeah. the points, yeah. and he can build like a complete model of the neighborhood. Like yeah. Plus all the artwork uh, that was in there. Oh, that's that's really, that's really neat. Really yeah. So it's like a portable unit, so. Yeah. Caves, fortunately, it will be simple case. What really the problem when you're talking about buildings and you're talking about the, uh, the refraction, you have like glasses, and window dark, bright. Some of them are mirrors. And in the same time, it's talking about the trees and bushes. It's the reconstruction of the, these become really a, uh, complicated. This is kind of another like when you can. This is not reconstruction. This is just the points, which the points projected on the on the image. I'll stop here, and we will uh, continue next Friday. If anyone have a uh, problem with the time, we're flexible. We can move it. It's fine. Next Friday will run for like either 45 minutes and the break, and then another 45 minutes, or continuous one hour and a half. Whatever you decide will be fine. OK? If you have any question, you just can like just drop by my office and talk to me. That's, that's really your pleasure. OK? Thank you very much. OK. You are very welcome. See you next week.